Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with The Movement System. In this video, we're gonna talk about aerobic versus anaerobic conditioning. A lot of the information for this video comes from the book, Ultimate MMA Conditioning by Joel Jameson, and I will have this book as well as other books that I recommend linked in the description below. I think this is a really good book for learning the principles of conditioning, not just for MMA athletes, but as it applies to a bunch of different athletes and generally developing energy systems. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about aerobic conditioning and how we apply that both to endurance athletes and also how we apply aerobic conditioning for mixed sport athletes like soccer players or MMA athletes. And then also how we actually do anaerobic conditioning and how we can structure intervals in a way that's most productive and efficient for athletes to train with. There's a lot of really good science to this. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the science and then also give you actual practical examples and numbers to go by. Let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, so let's go ahead and start with aerobic conditioning. And importantly, this is not just for endurance athletes. Even anaerobic athletes, like football players and soccer athletes and MMA athletes that need to recover between hard bouts of effort are gonna use their aerobic system. So a lot of athletes can benefit from an aerobic base, some more than others. For example, a baseball player or an American football player or someone who's very, very power-based is gonna probably need an aerobic base the least amount. And an endurance athlete who's gonna perform really long events like cross-country runs, triathlons, things like that, they're gonna need the most amount of aerobic work overall. And then there's a lot of athletes in the middle somewhere, like a soccer midfielder or an MMA athlete, where they're kind of anaerobic, they're gonna to need to sprint, but they will benefit significantly from good aerobic conditioning. And there are three main types of aerobic conditioning that we're gonna talk about. The first is just long, slow distance work or aerobic base training. This type of aerobic base training typically requires the highest amount of volume and typically we don't see very good benefits unless we get to at least 60 to 90 minutes per session. Importantly, this type of training has to be done at a low enough heart rate where it's not taxing and fatiguing. So we wanna be below the anaerobic or the lactate threshold. For most athletes, it's gonna be most beneficial for this aerobic base training to be performed with a heart rate of around 120 to 150 beats per minute. For younger athletes, we're probably gonna be on the top end of that. For older athletes, potentially towards the lower end of that. Now importantly, we're gonna apply this aerobic base training differently for an endurance athlete like a cyclist compared to an anaerobic athlete like a boxer. An endurance athlete like a cyclist is going to be doing cycling for the entirety of that aerobic training session and they're not gonna vary much from that because there's not that much carryover between improving running performance and improving cycling. You want to have that entire session focused on building economy and efficiency in the cycling movement pattern. That's actually very different than the approach that a boxer would take. A boxer who's trying to develop conditioning for boxing may also benefit from this aerobic base work, but they're probably gonna cycle through 15 minute bouts of a bunch of different modalities so they can more preferentially develop a broad peripheral vascular network. What do I mean by that? Instead of them practicing one cyclical movement pattern like a cyclist in developing economy, they don't need cycling economy. They need efficiency and good blood flow through a lot of different muscles and movement patterns. So they may, for example, do 15 minutes of jogging, 15 minutes of rower or ski erg, 15 minutes of jump rope, 15 minutes of sparring or light bag work, followed by one or two more 15 minute sessions of boxing specific drills. Now, if you look at their heart rates, the cyclist and the boxer throughout that training may have the same heart rate, 140, 145 beats per minute for 60 to 90 minutes, for example, but the adaptations they're gonna get from doing that training differently are going to be more beneficial for each of them in their own sport. Now moving on to the second way that we could do aerobic conditioning, we're gonna see that aerobic conditioning is not just about long distance work. Aerobic training method number two does come from ultimate MMA conditioning and it is called cardiac power intervals. This method is actually a pretty simple interval training method. It's just one to two minutes at near maximal heart rate followed by three to six minutes of recovery. Now there's a lot of different modalities for this and we'll get slightly different adaptations based on the one we choose. For example, we could do sprints, we could do bike sprints, we could do sled push, and all of those would get us similar adaptations in terms of getting our heart rate near maximal for one to two minutes and resting for three to six minutes, but we're gonna get slightly different adaptations with each. If we choose running, we're gonna specifically get better at running in repeated sprints. That's probably a good idea, especially for someone like a soccer player. Choosing sled work instead for one to two minutes may be a better choice if you're an athlete who has to push another athlete, for example, a football lineman working on some aerobic conditioning. Regardless of what modality you choose though, you wanna make sure you have enough rest here, about three to six minutes of rest for one to two minutes of work. 
This is about a one to three work to rest ratio, and that's gonna give us enough time to recover between intervals so that we can actually go hard enough during the work bout. Ideally, that recovery is low enough intensity that it allows your heart rate to come back down to around 120 to 130 beats per minute. This means that we probably don't wanna be jogging in between work bouts, we wanna be walking instead. If we're jogging, we're probably gonna take away from the amount of work that we can do when we go into that next work bout. So that is the interval training method or the cardiac power interval method. And then our third type of aerobic conditioning is threshold training. Now threshold training I saved for last because this is the, probably actually the most fatiguing because we're gonna spend the most amount of time near our anaerobic threshold. Threshold work is often also called over under training. And if our anaerobic threshold is say 155 beats per minute, we may be working three to five minutes at 160 beats per minute, and then three to five minutes down to 150 beats per minute, and kind of going over and under that threshold to specifically drive adaptations at the anaerobic threshold. This type of training can be effective and specific to improving your lactate threshold, but it also can be very fatiguing and you wanna make sure you're also getting that aerobic base work in and not just doing threshold work. All right, those three training methods were more specific to aerobic training. Now let's talk about anaerobic conditioning. Importantly, there are a ton of options for anaerobic conditioning. I'm just gonna use three examples that are pretty common for this video. Anaerobic conditioning method number one is lactic power intervals. These typically involve 20 to 40 seconds of max intensity effort with one to three minutes of rest between sets. We're typically doing these at least three times as a series. So for example, 30 seconds on, 90 seconds rest. 30 seconds on, 90 seconds rest. Three times as a series, rest for a little while, and then do three series in one workout. Depending on how your training session is structured, you can just do this as a workout in itself, or you can, for example, work in some skills training in between these conditioning efforts. Now importantly, this is the evidence-based conditioning approach that is generally recommended, for example, with the work to rest ratio chart from the NSCA CSCS textbook. And this is a conditioning approach that a lot of coaches do use where we can actually get to high intensity and then give the athlete enough rest. So we would consider this protocol pretty much complete rest between intervals. In practice, a lot of coaches will also use this second method that we're now gonna talk about. This essentially involves doing limited rest or incomplete rest between intervals. For example, for this type of training, we may do 90 seconds to 120 seconds of work bouts with only one to two minutes of rest in between. So this is closer to a one to one work to rest ratio, but we're still trying to drive high intensity. Naturally, this will make this type of conditioning a bit more fatiguing and we won't quite be able to get to maximum intensity with each of the work bouts. But the idea behind this second conditioning method with incomplete rest is that we're gonna be preferentially driving those adaptations of buff and metabolic changes. I think there's utility to both the lactic capacity method where we have incomplete rest and the lactic power method where we have longer complete rest. For wrestlers and MMA athletes, for example, who are gonna be frequently performing in these highly fatigued states as they're going through a competition, we can specifically train in these more fatigued states and drive those adaptations that are gonna be beneficial for those athletes. So it's really your call as a coach, which one of those two you wanna more preferentially train for your athletes that you're working with. And then the third type of anaerobic conditioning that we're gonna talk about is alactic conditioning. And this type of conditioning is very fast, just seven to 10 seconds of effort with two to five minutes of rest. There are a lot of different options for this, including jump squats, sprints, bounding drills, plyometric push-ups, resisted sprints, all of these methods that are very high intensity and often involve resistance for just a short period of time, seven to 10 seconds, will really drive that alactic power production. For this method, we're preferentially training the maximum amount of power that we can create in 10 seconds and giving the athlete adequate rest between efforts here. This is a really important type of conditioning to program for athletes who have a sport that involves maximum power output or explosive movements, which is a lot of sports. So overall, we talked about six different conditioning methods and based on your sport, your individual athlete and the type of phase that you're in with your training, you're gonna have to decide which combination of each different method is going to be optimal. And honestly, there's no exact right answer as to what amount of volume of each of these different conditioning methods is going to be optimal. That's where it does come down to understanding the science of training, also managing fatigue and looking at your athletes and making game time decisions on that. 
If you want to learn more about conditioning, check out the links to different books that I linked in the description below. And I'm also going to be adding an entire conditioning module to my course, Program Design 101. That is a course that helps you write effective programs for your athletes. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can head to themovementsystem.com or get started by downloading the free five-step guide to writing a strength conditioning program in the description below. That'll also add you to my email list where you'll get things like a free program template and free research reviews and notes and other things that I send out to my email list as I discover them. Thanks so much for watching guys and I will catch you in the next one.